I made 21,000 in Bombay in my first salary. The only thing I could afford to do was look at the salary slip and cry once in a while. Okay. My name is Hari. I grew up poor. Uh, I grew up poor is my favorite uh, dard card to play. Uh, so whenever my friends are telling a story, a great hobby that I have is I like really whacking them with my dard card from my childhood. So if someone's just like, oh, do you remember playing games on the Game Boy it was so much fun? I'll immediately just switch to like, I never had a Game Boy growing up. <laughs> a friend in class had one. If I stayed really quiet, he'd let me watch. That was fun. <laughs> or like, I'm waiting for someone to just uh, tell about their birthday party, and they'll be like, oh, we just moved houses, so uh, there were only like four people at my themed birthday party. And <laughs> immediately, I'm just like, my birthday theme was sadness. <laughs> this one birthday, my parents couldn't afford cake. So they got me a cupcake, and then I ate that cupcake alone in my room, which was also the hall of the house <laughs> and the dining room. Sometimes we'd also cook there. Great birthday. <laughs> this inherent sadness that I have, I inherited from my dad. Some people get money and property and all that. I got that. Random moments in childhood, I'll ask him a random question, and my dad would just hit me with his dirt cards, <laughs> which is how I grew up like this, right? So I'd go to my dad and ask him a random question, like, hey, dad, like, all my friends have cable, so can we also get, like, cable TV? And my dad would immediately switch to. <laughs> in my childhood, I didn't have a TV. We didn't have electricity. I was malnourished. You were 70 kilos. I was 28 kilos. <laughs> And if I had to take a shit, I had to go outdoors, behind the hill, because my house didn't have a toilet. Why don't you think about that for a bit? <laughs> and I'm just standing there like, so that's a firm no on the cable then? <laughs> I mean, he could have just said no, right? He could have just looked at me and he could have been like, no, son, we can't get cable, but no. <laughs> so thanks for growing up with all this. Uh, I had only one single aim uh, to do when I grew up. I want to get rich, right? Get rich and make dad happy. Become a middle class superhero, okay? This was the goal. I was hustle culture before hustle culture was invented, right? I was a 13 year old kid sitting in my room and going, success is 90% perspiration and 30% inspiration. Why? <laughs> because I sold a Pokemon Tazo to my younger brother for 20 rupees, okay? But in my head, it's like millionaire mindset, right? And I had this big misconception. The misconception was that when I grew up and became an employed adult, I'd be able to afford things, okay? I made 21,000 in Bombay in my first salary. The only thing I could afford to do was look at the salary slip and cry once in a while, okay? <laughs> but, under se to wind diesel, family, right? So, uh, <laughs> suddenly, every month out of this 21,000, I'm still sending 2,000 religiously to my dad, right? Family contribution. And then, uh, this one day on a random call, uh, something else we are talking about, and my dad is just like, oh, you think sending 2,000 rupees home is a big deal? You know, at your age, I used to do so much more for my family. You'd think that a line like that would hurt a 21-year-old, but not me, because hustle culture, right? What would I do? I would go to YouTube and watch motivational videos, okay? Where some, this, this person, in a very aggressive voice, is just like, take that pain and put it to work. And this 21-year-old me just sitting and going like, give pain employment, okay, I can do that. And then, and then finally, uh, I did it, right? I put my pain to use and I got a better job, better salary, so now I'm sending more money home. Uh, I'm buying things for home, so suddenly I've gotten a microwave for the house, I've gotten a washing machine, uh, I got a double door fridge for the house. Like you don't have to defrost it every week or anything. Like it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> so did all of that. Uh, my dad was quiet through all this, right? Like so it's not that he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy enough to be vocal about it. But soon enough, 
my day came, right? Where my dad came to me and he said, listen, I need a favor from you. Little bit of context. Uh, my dad and I went through midlife crisis together. <laughs> uh, I was in my 20s, which are apparently the new 50s, right? My dad was in the old 50s. So there was a little bit of a midlife crisis overlap, right? Where like both of us are just like, life me kuch maza nahi aara, kuch quirky karte hai, right? <laughs> in our heads, obviously. Because I was the only person who had the money to fund this whole ZNMD quirky vibes that's going on, right? So dad comes to me, he's like, listen, I need a favor. Uh, there's a farm in Idiki, and farming is my new passion. And I'd like to buy it <laughs> and solve my midlife crisis. I'm kidding, he didn't say that. He said, there is good investment opportunity. Would you like to contribute? <laughs> and uh, I stood there, and I knew how important this was for my dad. So I said, uh, sure thing, dad, I'll figure it out. And the amount that he was asking for at that point was twice of my life savings, right? So, uh, but I stood there like a true hero, and I said, I'll take care of it. So I took all my life savings, and then I took all of my friends' life savings <laughs> that I could collect. <laughs> and I sent it all to dad, and the uh, farm was bought. There's this thing with midlife crises, though, that I overlooked. <laughs> Much like lace potato chips, you cannot just have one, right? <laughs> Soon enough, there was another midlife crisis uh, where I couldn't contribute as much as I wanted to, uh, or I couldn't be a part of it as much as I wanted to. And then on another random call, months later, I heard the same line from my dad again, where he was just like, oh, you thought giving that much money was enough? You know how much, how much I did for my family at your age? And then again, and then again, multiple calls, the same thing. Not enough, not enough, not enough. And one of these days, uh, listening to my dad say that, I was done. I was done trying to play superhero. I was done trying to save the world. Done trying to save my dad, for sure. <laughs> uh, so I proceeded to have my own midlife crisis, right? Uh, <laughs> I quit my job. Uh, I broke up from my relationship. Uh, stopped eating food properly, stopped functioning pretty much. Uh, I don't remember a lot about this period, but what I can say very confidently is that there was a lot of alcohol, a lot less showers, and some very, very, very concerned friends. Here's the thing with sadness though, right? Uh, if you sit with it long enough, something has to give, right? At some point, something has to give. Like when you hit rock bottom, the only way is up and all that. Like it's true, right? Like something has to give at some point where time gives you a chance every day to do better by yourself, right? To be happier. And whenever you're ready, you can take that chance. And uh, one of the days when I felt ready, I took it. Uh, no magnanimous things, uh, no uh, middle class superhero stuff that would make my dad proud. Just uh, bare minimum guy things that would make me happy. Uh, I'd go on a walk sometimes, eat decent food, take a shower every day, brush my teeth regularly, that kind of stuff. And one of those bare minimum days when I woke up, I felt like I woke up with one thing that I did not inherit from my dad. That day when I woke up, I woke up feeling like I was enough. I had enough stories, enough friends, enough money in my bank account to eat a chicken fry once in a while, and that would do. And for the sake of the story, I really wished <laughs> that this big realization came at a big moment, right? Like at the end of a marathon or like stargazing at midnight in a quaint town in India. But no, <laughs> it came in a dingy flat in Andheri West, looking at my stained mirror, mouth tasting of Colgate toothpaste. I suddenly realized that I had the one thing that my dad did have, enough. So that, my friends, is the story of how I resigned from my full-time job of being a middle-class superhero. <laughs> I want to say one thing before I leave. Uh, there's one thing I truly hate about storytelling. Okay, sorry, Shantanu, sorry, Kamyu. <laughs> like, the worst part of storytelling is that it seems like for a hero to exist, there needs to be a villain, right? Hero and villain fight, villain loses, hero wins. Everybody goes home happily ever after. In this story, 
it's very easy for my dad to look like the villain. But there's no chance that in this one I'm letting him lose. See, my dad feels like he didn't have enough because for years he actually didn't. I was malnourished and I had to go behind to the hill to take a shit as a kid. It takes me less than five seconds to say that entire line. I told this entire story faster than he would have taken to take a single shit in the outdoors every goddamn day sitting in that stench. Think about going through all that and then leveling your family up. Think about getting your kids the education that you did not have the access to. I could afford therapy and work on this whole idea of enough because my dad gave me the privilege to do it. So in every sense, this whole idea of enough that I have today is borrowed from my dad. You see, in stories, there is this whole idea of heroes and villains. <laughs> I don't think real life works that way, right? There are people who wake up every day and they try to do their best. Sometimes they do okay and some other times they don't. So now when my dad calls me and he says, you know, what you're doing right now is nothing. I used to do so much more at your time. I see it for what it really is, right? It's a story from a time where my dad feels like he was the hero. So all I say in return is all I've probably ever wanted to hear from him. I tell him, you did good, dad. You're a middle-class superhero. Thank you.